morning everybody. We have finally arrived at our last part of our journey with Jesus. We're going to read a little bit of what we read last week on Easter Sunday and then we're going to finish by reading all the way to the end of chapter 24. So chapter 24 beginning to read at verse 36 to the end of the chapter. While they were still talking about this Jesus himself stood among them and said to them peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. The Christ will suffer. He told them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. We thank God for his word. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for... The, the word, the Bible, we thank you for Dr. Luke, for his gospel. We thank you that these past weeks we've been able to read it. And we pray, Lord, again, that today as we open it, that you would speak to each of our hearts. That we might be encouraged in our walk with you. That, Father, we might be blessed this morning as we hear your voice. And we pray, Lord, that you alone might be heard, seen and glorified. For we ask it in your name. Amen. So I want to start this morning by saying thank you to Dr. Luke for leading us all this time, for preparing his book and for giving us this opportunity. It's been a privilege and a joy to be able to share what he has been teaching us. And we've come a long way, haven't we? 22 weeks of sermons. I know it seems perhaps a lot longer than that, but 22 weeks of sermons. And we started with journeying with Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem when he was about 12 years old. And since then, we've been in rivers, We've been in synagogues, towns, villages, the border country, people's homes, a mountain, the temple treasury. And then, of course, last weekend, we journeyed with Jesus to the cross. And we said, there they crucified him. There they crucified him. And the journey with Jesus from the cross to the tomb, we went out of the tomb and we went on Easter Sunday. We painted that trip trick, didn't we, of three different paintings, three scenes. And we looked at the tomb, the road to Emmaus and the locked room, which was probably the upper room where the disciples had enjoyed the Last Supper with Jesus. And there we met the characters at the tomb. We met Mary and the women and Peter and John. And we looked at Mr and Mrs Cleopas on the road to Emmaus and the ten disciples. And I've got to just explain something here because Alan questioned me last week. I said there were ten disciples and yet the Bible says there was eleven. It's true there were ten. The Bible refers to the eleven as it is referred to generally as the disciples. In John's Gospel they referred to as the twelve, even though there was only ten or eleven, depending on the timing. So it is right, it's not in, wrong in Scripture, just had to work it out and, and get the answer for Alan and I hope, uh, you know, he's wearing the same shirt as me today, so he's obviously back in tandem with me. So, we said that each of those places, there was confusion, there was rebuke, there was instruction, followed by a witness. And then... Before we get on this road to Bethany for the last part of our journey with Jesus, I want us to go back into this locked room. I want us to go back to where the disciples were, where Mr. and Mrs. Cleopas was, and where Jesus had appeared in the locked room without opening any doors. 
And in that locked room, there are four things that Jesus said as he was summing up to his disciples at the end of the ministry that we need to look at before we leave that locked room. And these four things, helpfully for us, Dr. Luke has put them, that in four verses, there's one in 46, there's one in 47, one in 48, and one in 49. But in 45, we find that Jesus opened their minds to the scriptures. This was the Old Testament, the, the Psalms and the prophets and, and all those books there. It was the Old Testament. He opened their mind to them. He was trying to teach them. He was giving them the direction that they needed to go on and do what he needed them to do next. And it had been quite a day, hadn't it? Quite a weekend for those disciples. A lot had been happening since that Thursday night, in fact, for that previous week. But that weekend, Jesus had died and he'd been buried and he rose again. And there they were on that Sunday night in that locked room. And he'd already sought to bring them peace, hadn't he? He said, it's me. It's me, guys. Touch me. Look at me. They see the holes. I can eat bread. I'm not dead. I'm not a ghost. And of course, a week later, he did the same for Thomas in the same room. And he showed him his nail prints in his hands. And he said, Thomas, touch them and see. And having done all this, he prepares these disciples with these last four things, these important points that applied to them in that upper room, but also apply to you and I today. So, firstly, verse 46, this is what he said. Jesus is speaking, he said, This is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. This, friends, is biblical theology. This is the biblical truth in a nutshell. If the disciples don't grasp this, if they can't get their heads around it, then they cannot take the good news to the world. Because this is the basis of all that Jesus had been teaching them. This needed to happen, he said, in order for the forgiveness of sins to be possible. Now then, of course, we stood around that cross last week, all those different people there, and we heard the rulers, the soldiers, and the criminals on the cross all calling for Jesus to save himself, to come down from the cross, to prove who he was. Not understanding, of course, as we said last week, that if he did, they would never have been able to be forgiven. And neither would you and I. You see, the basis of our faith, the basis of our Christian faith, relies on the truth that Jesus is the sinless Messiah, that he suffered and died on a cross, and that he rose from the dead and is alive today. And Jesus is reminding those disciples that this is what was written by him in the prophets and all of what we call the Old Testament. And this is the basis of our faith. And you know, there may be some who will tell you and try and persuade you that Jesus didn't actually die. They'll try and tell you that he was revived in a cold tomb and they got him off the cross before he'd actually expired. There'll be those who will claim that nobody can actually rise from the dead, that it's a, it's a picture story. There'll be others who want to claim and emphasise other aspects of the Christian faith as being far greater of importance and, and try and dismiss all this. But if the actions of Jesus dying on a cross and rising again are not at the core of our faith, then there is no Christian faith. Without his death and resurrection, it is all meaningless. Without his death and resurrection, we cannot know forgiveness of sins, and we cannot know life, and we cannot know eternal life as Jesus intended it. And Jesus was teaching these disciples on these final days, and he wanted to remind them again about what the scriptures said, about this vital truth of salvation relying upon the Messiah dying and rising again to life. Here at AIM Church, we've been reminded of this truth over these last 22 weeks as we've gone through Luke's Gospel. And as we draw to a close, Dr. Luke wants us to be abundantly clear that the basis of our Christian faith, our core belief, is that Jesus, the Saviour, died. He died as a punishment for our sin, and he rose again on the third day, conquering sin and death and opening up the way for us to eternal life. So please don't let anyone try and tell you anything different. Don't for a minute doubt that these events actually happened in the way that they are described exactly in the scriptures. Because it's upon this truth, upon this theology, that our faith exists. The second message that Jesus wanted his disciples to know is connected to the first and it's found in verse 47. Jesus continued and he said this, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You see, the basis of our faith leads to the purpose for what we are called to do. 
We're called to share this truth. A truth that says that Jesus died and rose again. And if people repent, they can be forgiven for their sins. That there is hope in our lives. And as the disciples stood there in that locked room, still reeling from all the shock and excitement of the risen Jesus being there, stood in the midst of them, Jesus points out that the scriptures also declare that this message of hope is going to be shared by those who are followers of Jesus. That they will preach it in his name and they will do so to all nations. You see, this isn't just a religion for the Jews. This is a faith that is for all people, of any background, of any social class, from any country, from any part of society. Yes, Jesus told them it was going to begin at Jerusalem, but that was where it was going to start, beginning at Jerusalem, not where it was going to stay. This was good news and it was going to be shared across the world. This wasn't a message that was going to bring people down and impose religious sanctions on people. This wasn't a faith that those who were in control of it had to decide whether they were worthy to be part of it. This wasn't exclusive to the leader's behest. This was a faith that was open to all because of the leader Jesus. This was a faith that was open to all on the understanding that if you seek forgiveness through repentance, you can have the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus. We all recognise that Jesus needed to die on a cross as a punishment for our sin. That we all needed to, Jesus to rise from the dead as our saviour so that we can know new and eternal life. Faith, this is that brings hope and life and joy and peace into the world and into our hearts. Jesus, I can imagine him stood there saying, lads, have you got this now? Do you understand what I'm trying to get across to you? Do you understand what this last three years has been all about? It's there, it's in the scriptures. Just grasp hold of this truth and go and share this message. I had to die for your sins. I had to rise again. Yes, you are my followers. And it's you, yes, you, who are going to go and tell the rest of the world. Starting at Jerusalem. The second important message for the disciples is it's going to be a mission. There's going to be an outreach. Whatever you want to call it, sharing the gospel truth, it's going to be sharing the message of Jesus. This is the way that God planned it. And those who received the message first were to pass it on. They were to build his church. And that same responsibility of passing that message on has been handed on down the ages. Pass the message on because of what Jesus did, that we can be forgiven and we can live life forever. See, this is another clarification that Jesus wants the people to see, that he wants you and I to see on our journey with Jesus these past weeks. We've seen how Jesus prepared the disciples, teaching and training them, and then sending them out to do what he had been doing. And this is what he wants you and I to do. This is what he wants you and I to do as his church today, to go out and to continue to share that life-changing message. Do you know, sometimes I think that you and I can be a little reluctant to do so. Take this, for example, this chap. Norman Cates shared this humorous story of a Christian who used to pray this prayer every morning. He used to pray, Lord, if you want me to go and be a witness today, please give me a sign to show me who it is. One day he found himself on a bus. The bus when a big man, a big burly man comes on, there's lots of seats on this bus, but he chooses to sit next to this Christian. And the bus set off and this guy's a bit uncomfortable because he's looking around, this is a big fella. And then all of a sudden, he's waiting for his bus to his stop to get off. And the next thing is, before he could get nervous, this next man, he starts to cry, he's weeping next to him. He bursts into tears. And he cries out with a loud voice, I need to be saved. I'm a lost sinner and I need the Lord. Won't somebody tell me how to be saved? And he turned to this guy who was sat next to him, this Christian, he pleaded with him and said, can you show me how to be saved? Well, the believer immediately bowed his head and he said, Lord, is this a sign? <laughs> Sometimes we can be guilty of missing the obvious. Missing the people around us who so obviously need a saviour. And we miss the opportunity to give the life-changing, life-saving message of hope that Jesus told his followers was their job to pass on. Do you know, I also think we can be guilty of making excuses sometimes. Thinking that the job of sharing the good news is perhaps somebody else's, perhaps the pastor, the preacher, which of course it is, but not exclusively so. 
Or perhaps we look for reasons not to do what we know that we should. Too old, too young, too uneducated, too tired, too, too infirm, too ill. There was literally a one-legged teacher from Scotland who came to Hudson Taylor to offer himself in service as a missionary in China. And Hudson Taylor asked him, he said, with only one leg, why do you think of going as a missionary? And George Scott, this guy, replied, because I don't see those with two legs going. So he decided to go himself, and he was appointed, and he went as a missionary to China. Whatever we do, let's not be guilty of missing the obvious or looking for excuses. Our responsibility and privilege is to do what those disciples were commissioned to do by Jesus himself, to share the message of repentance and forgiveness. Here, where we live in Appleton, with our neighbours, with our family, with our friends, through the events such as Coffee Aim, invites to Sunday worship, the starting, the planting of a church in Appleton Cross, yes, you, you all have a part to play. Each and every one of you is needed by God. Thirdly, in verse 48, Jesus says to those original disciples, he says, you are witnesses of these things. These disciples, they've been witnesses of the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They'd witnessed all that, the Jesus, all that Jesus, the Messiah, had taught. They'd witnessed him being crucified. They'd witnessed his sermons. They'd witnessed his miracles. They'd seen the lot. And right there in that room was the evidence that Jesus had risen from the dead because he was there and they'd fed him and they touched him and they could see him there in that room. These guys were the apostles, people who were commissioned by Jesus to go and do this work. They had the authority to share the message of truth and they'd been handpicked to be witnesses of it all. So, what does that mean for you and I today? Because we weren't there, we weren't direct witnesses. We don't have that apostolic authority. That's true. But what we do have is the direct apostolic authority or approval of the apostles by what is taught in the scriptures. Nearly every book of the New Testament is written or authorised by an apostle. We have the scriptures largely written about the life of Jesus in the early church, those who were witnesses of the risen Jesus. And it's the authority of scripture that we claim and which upon we act. And it's why it's so important that we read it. Why important we study it, learn it, claim it, rely upon it. For it's the eyewitness accounts of what happened to Jesus and the early church. It's what we are going to use to show and tell others. It's why I keep going on about it in these sermons. It's why the Bible is so important to us here at AIM Church. So I want to say to you this morning, if you've not got a modern version of the Bible that you can easily read, well then please come and see me at the end, because we want to buy you one, we want to give you one, so that you can read it, study it, understand it, and then share it. It's free, please come and tell me if you've not got a modern version. It's the authority by which you will share the message that Jesus wants you to share it as his witnesses. Fourthly, Jesus says to them, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed from on high. We are, of course, talking about the Holy Spirit, promised by God in the scriptures. Now, Jesus was about to physically leave this world, but the plan involved the Holy Spirit coming to indwell and empower the followers of Jesus. Jesus may well be going to be physically absent, but by God's power and presence, he was coming to indwell those who were his witnesses and his followers. Gordon Brownville's book, The Symbols of the Holy Spirit, tells about the great Norwegian explorer, Roald Amundsen. He was the first to discover the magnetic meridian of the North Pole and to discover the South Pole. And on one of his trips, Amundsen took with him a homing pigeon. And when it finally reached the top of the world, he opened the bird's cage and he set it free. Imagine, it said in this book, the, the delight of Amundsen's wife back in Norway when she looked up from her own front door and sees this pigeon circling around. You can imagine her exclaiming, he's alive, my husband is still alive. And so it was when Jesus ascended. He was gone, but the disciples clung to the promise that he would send the Holy Spirit. And with joy, when the dove-like Holy Spirit descended at Pentecost, they too as disciples were able to rejoice. They had with them that continual reminder that
that Jesus was alive and victorious at the right hand of the Father. And of course today that continues to be the Spirit's message. Jesus is still alive by his presence and his power working in us. We know he is alive. And Jesus was telling these disciples very clearly, I'm sending you what the Father promised. Stay in Jerusalem till he comes. Don't go and do anything, don't go anywhere, just stay there, wait. And of course that same Holy Spirit is the same Holy Spirit who indwells us today. It's the one that Jesus promised would come. And we can do nothing without him. Dwight Moody, the great American evangelist, had a campaign in England. And an English elderly pastor complained, he said, why do we need this Mr Moody? He's uneducated, he's inexperienced, who does he think he is anyway? Does he think he's got the monopoly on the Holy Spirit? And a younger, wiser pastor rose and said, no, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Mr Moody. Friends, you and I need to be monopolised by the Holy Spirit. We need to ensure that he is the one that monopolises our life. And then D.L. Moody shared this example. He was speaking to a large audience and he held up a glass. And he asked them, he said, how can I get the air out of this glass? And one man shouted, suck it out with a pump. And Moody said, no, that would create a vacuum and it would shatter the glass. And that was followed by many other suggestions as to how they could get the air out of this glass. Until finally Moody smiled and he picks up a jug of water and he pours the water in. And he said, now all the air is removed. And he went on to explain that victory in the Christian life is not accomplished by a sin being plucked out here or there, but by being filled completely with the Holy Spirit. Friends, Jesus was given this final advice, these final instructions before he left the disciples. And then we go on and in the second book that Dr. Luke wrote, one that we've studied before, describes how ten days later the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost and fills the disciples. And we know from our previous series in Acts that when the Holy Spirit came, things got very exciting indeed. If we're going to do what Jesus wants and expects us to do in this church, we need the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. We need his power at work in us and in his church here in Appleton. The disciples in that locked room that day had been confused. They'd been downcast, they'd been frightened and fearful and excited and shocked. And in many ways, that's a picture of the church today, isn't it? We're no different. Coming out of lockdown, coming out of COVID, some of these emotions we've experienced ourselves. Sometimes we might feel downcast about the way things seem to be going for Jesus and his church in our nation and in some places around the world. And sometimes we can miss the excitement, actually, of what God is doing in places around the world. And if we're not careful, we can tend to lock ourselves away in a room and keep the world at bay. At the end of their journey with Jesus, the disciples were getting one last summary of what Jesus expected about what the plan was. About how it was going to be carried out. He was giving them the guidance they needed to know what he wanted them to do. And that same guidance applies to you and I as his church today. Our Christian theology is our core belief. It's that which we must stand on in truth, unchanging, that Jesus the Messiah suffered, died, buried, rose again and ascended and will one day return. The reason he did so is that we could repent and receive forgiveness for our sins. And this is the message that we are charged with sharing, a life-changing message of hope. Our authority comes from the scriptures, truth handed down to us by the apostles to be our guide and our message. And we're indwelt by the empower of the Holy Spirit, working powerfully to change our lives and help us to change the lives of others through his power and presence. And this is the final part of what Dr. Luke wants us to see as Jesus needing to happen. Needing for the disciples to grasp, to hear and to understand. And it's what you and I here in church in Appleton need to hear, grasp and understand. But it's when we do, that's when we can be effective in doing what Jesus entrusted and commanded us to do. It brings us clarity instead of confusion. It brings us joy instead of fear. It gives us excitement instead of being downcast. This is the message that down the ages, Dr. Luke wants us to hear from Jesus. Well, that was the introduction. 
don't worry, the conclusion is not as long as the introduction. Sometime later, it says, we read that Jesus led the disciples out towards Bethany. This very last part of the journey with Jesus. Jesus was going there and he was going to be taken from this world to be with his father. The disciples' time on earth with Jesus was rapidly coming to an end. Can you imagine the atmosphere on that road as they walked towards Bethany and the Mount of Olives? Can you imagine the emotion? The parting of friends who will not see each other again in this life. The shared memories, the highs and lows of the last three years. Jobs given up, families left behind, miracles witnessed, some amazing Bible studies and sermons. Some amazing adventures and memories for the disciples to take with them. All now coming to journey's end. What did they talk about on that road to Bethany? Well, we don't know. Nobody tells us. What we do know is when they got there, I can see them stood around Jesus and the 11 disciples. And all of a sudden he takes his nail pierced hands and he raises them and he blesses them. It tells us there in Dr. Luke that he raises his hands and he blesses them. And this is not just simply some religious ceremony, some elaborate way, some fitting way of Jesus saying goodbye to his disciples. I think it's something much more deeper than that. I think Dr. Luke wants us to see something deeper in the blessing which Jesus gave to his disciples. I think we need to think along the lines of the priestly blessing that Yahweh, the Lord himself, told Moses to tell Aaron and the priests to bless the people with. Numbers chapter 6 verses 22 to 27. It says this, familiar words, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And of course, if you look in Numbers, you'll then see that the footnote of that, the, the Lord himself then says, he says, so they will put my name on the Israelites with the blessing from the priests, and I will bless them. Personally, Yahweh was going to bless the people. God was saying that he would do the blessing. This wasn't just words or sentiment. This was a promise from the Almighty that he was personally going to bless them and what they were doing. And I think Dr. Luke wants us to see that here in Jesus with his disciples before he ascends into heaven. He raises his hands and he blesses them. And you know, if Jesus was personally blessing them, those who will carry out his world mission, I think we can expect to see success. Because if the Lord is blessing it, blessing his own work, well then surely we can expect to see blessings to follow. It is as if Jesus is saying, this mission that you're going on, lads, will succeed. It has my blessing. The church will be built. My kingdom will be built. Just go and do what I'm telling you to do. My blessing is with you. It will happen. You will be successful in this task that I'm sending you for. Can you imagine what assurance that meant to these disciples who were about to see Jesus leave them? The certainty of the promise of what was to come, that blessing on the work that they were doing. And this morning, of course, 2,000 years on, we know that that blessing was a blessing because the church has expanded. It's continued to grow. It's gone from country to country, from continent to continent, over 2,000 years. And here this morning, little old Appleton, we're part of that church. We're part of God's blessing. Friends, let's take hold of that assurance, that certainty that if Jesus is sending us out with his blessing, we will see success for his kingdom. We will see his work bring fruit. Let's take hold of this as we take the torch from previous generations and we work with it now and we pass it on to those who will follow us. Well, while he was blessing them, Jesus himself then, of course, goes on a journey. He goes without them, he leaves them behind. He ascends into heaven. Can you imagine in your mind's eye what that must have been like that day? Their friend literally ascending before them, having blessed them, and they left behind. The blessing of Jesus falling upon them as he ascends to his father. His work complete, going home to be at the right hand of his father, leaving behind those he has trained and trusted, commissioned and blessed to take on that work and to take it out to the nations. What did the disciples do now? Well, we know, we don't because we've already looked at it, but this journey with Jesus, it was over. It was finished. It had come to an end. He'd literally come before their eyes. How would they respond? How, how would you and I have responded? Would we have gone and done the things that he wanted us to do? Or, or would we perhaps have just thought, well, 
We might as well go back to what we were doing before. Jesus is now gone. We, we've no leader. We can't, can't do anything. Would the momentum of what Jesus started gain traction or would it come to a halt? So what did the disciples do? Well, Dr. Luke tells us. It says, then they worshipped him. They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. There and then as they saw him ascend into heaven, there they worshipped him. Dr. Luke wants us to see that Jesus is also God. They no longer simply worshipped God. It tells us that they worshipped Jesus too. They knew that he was part of the deity. It all started clicking into place. He was part of the Godhead. He was part of the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. They worshipped Jesus. And far from being sad, they were filled with joy. Jesus had blessed them and they were filled with joy and they went back to Jerusalem. And this time they, they did what they were told. They didn't go into the wrong place. They went back to Jerusalem and they were getting ready for who Jesus had promised was coming, the Holy Spirit, and for the work that they were about to do. While Jesus had journeyed home, they had a new journey to go on. A journey not with Jesus, but a journey for Jesus. And so we come to the very last verse of Dr. Luke's first book and we are literally back to where we started we started our series with jesus when he was a boy in the temple age 12 we're back at the very beginning actually of dr luke's book because that started too with zachariah in the temple in jerusalem we're back in the temple in jerusalem where it all started verse 53 and it tells us they stay continually at the temple praising god they come full circle they were back where it all started. And I wonder, does Dr. Luke perhaps want us to see that these disciples, blessed by Jesus, fully equipped and prepared, waiting for the promised Holy Spirit, spent their time praising God in the very place, the stronghold, if you like, of the religious establishment who just a few weeks before had taken Jesus, told lies about him and crucified him on a cross. The temple, the heart of the religious leaders those who were anti-Jesus. But no longer were these disciples, no longer were these men hidden away, locked away in an upper room. They were in the midst of those who opposed, disregarded and couldn't care less about Jesus. They were full of joy and they spent their time praising God. What a witness this was. And that was before they'd even got started. Is that where we are today, this morning? Is that where we as a church are this morning? Are we blessed by Jesus and so full of joy that in the midst of a world who oppose Jesus, disregard Jesus, couldn't care less about Jesus, that we still praise him with hearts full of joy as a witness? Because of all that Jesus has done, because of all that we know, we're able to praise him with those hearts full of joy. I hope so. You see, the alternative is, it's like the little boy who after attending church one Sunday morning, knelt at his bedside that night and prayed and he said dear God we had a good time at church today but I wish you'd been there how sad is that friends Jesus had ascended into heaven where he waits for God to send him again to this world to judge it and to take those who belong to him to be with him forever we're left we are on a journey for Jesus and we have been given all that we need to do what Jesus wants and bring him glory and our journey with Jesus these past months has been about us learning, about us being reminded, challenged and changed, so that we, like the disciples, are ready and filled by the Holy Spirit and are effectively journeying for Jesus. It's my prayer at the end of this series that you know God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit in a deeper way than you did when we set out all those weeks ago. It's my prayer that we as a church are ready for all that Jesus wants to do in us, and through us. See, this is not the end of the journey for Jesus because by his spirit, we're accompanied by him as we journey for him. And until that glorious day when our journey takes us to meet him, either when he takes us home personally or when he comes a second time to take us all to be with him forever, it's our privilege to be his witnesses. Until then, we've got a journey to go on. A journey that Jesus started all those years ago and which today we are privileged to share in. It's not always an easy journey, is it? We know that. But as sure as Jesus ascended 
And as sure as he one day will return again to this world, we know that a reward awaits us for what we do while we're on this journey for Jesus. One cold February day, a snail started climbing, a journey started climbing an apple tree. And as he inched slowly upwards, the worm struck its head from a crevice in the bark to offer some advice. He said, you're wasting your energy. There isn't a single apple up there. To which the snail replied, there will be when I get there. The journey we are all on will, of course, be more than worth it when we get there. So let's make the most of our journey for Jesus now. And let's enjoy getting on with all that Jesus wants us to do. Are you ready to journey for Jesus? Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you that we are privileged to journey for Jesus. We thank you that through the witness of others that we came to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. Father, I thank you this morning that we here as your church have been equipped, are made ready, called and challenged and commanded to go and to serve you. Father, I pray that we will together be your witnesses here in Appleton and beyond. That by your spirit we will be bound together in our work, our worship and our witness. That you, Lord, might be glorified and that one day we might be rewarded by you for what we have done in this life. Let us, Lord, live our lives completely for your service, for your honour and for your glory. Inspire and encourage as we pray. We thank you for Dr Luke for his journey that we have been on. Help us, Lord, to remember it to let it make a difference in our lives that we in turn might become more like Jesus. These things we ask in his name. Amen. Amen.